if you have an idea, there is a resource for you. Right. And and likely an incentive for you. And partners and yes. collaborators. Yes. Yes. It's a very deep bench. Right. Welcome to the Golden Group Strategic Growth Podcast, featuring expert insights, interviews with thought leaders, and business plan triage. Hosted by Kyle Golding, award-winning entrepreneur, CEO, and chief strategic idealist for the Golding Group. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Strategic Growth Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Golding. I'm joined today by Kara Evans, the director of Axis at Francis Tuttle. Yes. And immediate past chair of the Oklahoma Venture Forum, something we have in common. True, true. Right. But I still have the reins until July. Okay, technically still the chair. <laughs> No, I mean, for all intents and purposes, Gina, who's succeeding me, will be taking over. But it was it was an incredible experience. And OVF has meant a lot to me throughout my career. We're going to go deeper into that. But yeah. first, we're going to talk about access. Okay. We're going to talk about some of the things that you do in economic development yeah. and education and all of those things that where we cross paths. Yeah. So tell everyone first, before we talk about it, tell everyone a little bit more about yourself, a little bit where you come from, your education sure. and kind of. And then we'll talk about access. We'll talk about BF. We'll talk about all kinds of issues. Awesome. Well, I am from Northwest Oklahoma. I was even born in Cherokee, so county seat of Alfalfa County. Um, uh, and so I grew up out there. And I, uh, a lot of people in my family are self-employed, and so that was really my first kind of entree into mm. this. Is that if you're not working, you're not eating. <laughs> That's true. And, and even when you think of like rural or agricultural communities, almost everyone is a small business owner. Right. With, you know, whether they're self-employed or not, like it, it is just, it's part of life. Because if you don't make it, it doesn't exist. Right. And so um, I kind of took that mindset with me when I went to Oklahoma State mm. on an engineering scholarship, which I prompt, I, I, I like to joke that I am like a model of resilience in academics because... I went there with a full ride and a seat scholar, and I had so much fun that I didn't let my <laughs> education interfere with my schooling and got kicked out. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of fun in Stillwater. Yes, yes. it's a fun town. It's a, it's a common story, unfortunately. But but the beautiful thing is, is that relationships that you make. Mm. And so I stayed close with the College of Engineering and Architecture, and even though I ultimately wound up with a marketing degree, mm. I did have five major changes and got to take a lot of summer school and graduated in three years. Uh, and so I actually did go in to work in uh, architecture, engineering, and construction mm. after I graduated. Uh, I moved to Dallas. And uh, so I worked for a global construction firm and we got to do projects between Dallas and Houston. And then Oklahoma did a uh, program where they uh, were trying to recruit back um, Oklahomans who had moved to Texas. Right. The, and they, the boomerang program. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so that was actually a very cool thing. And mm. it allowed me to, it was quite awesome. I mean, the Department of Commerce basically sent a moving company. They packed up my entire apartment in Addison and then drove it to Tulsa and unpacked it in my apartment there, put wow. it away, dishes, everything. Can't beat that. It was wild. Uh, and so I, I got to come back to Oklahoma and work for Flintco. And so a that, great company. Great company. And so that is then what let me see small business from an even different angle because all of the subcontractors that we worked with and the trades, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that are aging and mm -hmm. it is a um, hard, well, it's manual labor. Yeah. And so I also got opened up to um, really that your body eventually gives out. And so you need to have kind of what's that next act or, you know, you hope that there's not like disability or something like that because that's a major workforce thing. Then we decided um, my dad is an angel investor and has participated in, um, I think, I would say almost all of the funds in Oklahoma. And so, but we decided that um, we were going to do one for Northwest Oklahoma. And so we raised a couple million dollars um, and participated at that time. That's when like seed step angels and things were launching right. off with I2E. And so we did some stuff with uh, Wichita and with, uh, there was a Houston group and a Northwest Arc. I mean, it's interesting how things like, come around right. again. In that, I needed to make a new set of relationships within the uh, startup and entre entrepreneurial ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So I went, to, this is my second story on OSU being humbling, is I went to uh, OSU for a master's of science in entrepreneurship and I walked the stage and everyone congratulated me and then I found out that I wasn't conferred. 
And I got to have a very fun conversation with Dr. Berenger. And oh. then I took what credits I could to Southeastern and have an MBA with a focus in entrepreneurship from okay. Southeastern. So go Savage Storm. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you got it done. I got it done. And that's around the same time that um, Dr. Mack was going to be the state superintendent at uh, for, for Oklahoma for uh, the Department of Career Tech. And she had been at Autry. And Autry is um, a tech center in Enid close to where I grew up. And she said, I think that you'd be really great at, now that you've done this, at working with startups. And so I actually went to work uh, in the incubator where I was actually the very first tenant. So in 2008, when the Jim Strait incubator opened. So it's everything is unrelated, but interrelated. Right. And so. Full circle. Full circle. Right. And I just fell and in love with I think it's great because you, you have the experience. They didn't just bring someone in randomly. They brought someone in from the area with experience, not just experience in general in that incubator understands like, yeah. like you were saying rural areas and, and urban areas they have their differences and you can't just transplant one person from the other but you, you were really of the area and from the area and you had the experience in that yes. space and so you were able to bring all this back to that space. yes and i just drank the career tech kool-aid i joke <laughs> that i am a career tech evangelist okay. and so i have was uh in the entry system for around nine years i've done stuff with northwest tech with green country um, there's 29 districts in the state. It's an incredible, incredible system. And um, I had the opportunity just almost two years ago uh, to come to Francis Tuttle whenever Jennifer uh, McGraw was going to OCAST. A great opportunity to, to follow a great leader. Yes. But also, like, twice, twice I got to follow her. And oh, she had right. been in career tech even before that. We knew each other when she was at Great Plains and Lawton. Mm. And so incredible, you know, person and talent. And so, yeah, so I got to follow her at Francis Tuttle. And then when I took over the OF, OVF chair, I succeeded her. There you go. It's a good pattern you have. Right. There, for sure. So now let's talk about Francis Tuttle. Yes. And let's talk about the access program at, mm -hmm. at Francis Tuttle because it's relatively new. No. Okay. Uh, the rebrand is ish new. Okay. Uh, so actually, Francis Tuttle has had a certified business incubator for 10 years. Oh. And so um, you might have seen it as the launch pad. And Fred Green was who initially mm -hmm. got that stood up. And it was off of Covell and the, um, they call it the BIC. It's the, it was the Business Innovation Center. And now is like, uh, I think City of Edmond has offices there now. Mm -hmm. When Francis Tuttle let that property go. Um, and we moved to the Danforth campus. A brand new building. Brand new building. Brand new name. Brand new logo. And so Axis is... Uh, what we are called now, but we still perform self-employment training for anyone that is a uh, um, stakeholder in our district. So uh, we do small business coaching, and then we do have the certified uh, incubator space, and we have uh, co-working as well. So who are the businesses that you're looking to bring in? What what size are they? How early are they in the process? Sure. And, and what are they getting through the participation? Yeah. Oklahoma's business incubation uh, program is incredible um, from an incentive standpoint, but also from a reciprocity standpoint. Every single one of them is unique. So at Danforth, it's a little bit different facility than we had at Covell. So sometimes your facility mm. um, limits a little bit of whom you can have in. But we are like industry agnostic. So um, there are a few rules like uh, the retail and um, things that are directly related to oil and gas are not um what's well, because we're diversifying the economy and right. because a lot of the incubators are on uh public properties and so it doesn't make sense when you have students and normal traffic of a district to have customers coming in and right. out so um retail's hard in an incubator scenario yes so, yeah but like uh citizens in the vault is is doing an incredible thing right right, um, up, um, right on main street and yeah where they have act or yes. admin right so of all yeah. the access right um, and so that's that's a different, you know, you go location, <laughs> location, location. For sure. And so um, we are set up with, um, we have 12 Class A office spaces and five uh, light shops. And so um, we tend to see more SaaS companies, professional services. Um, we do have actually um, two that are manufacturing, but they are in... Um, an early phase, and so they are utilizing the lower overhead and the wraparound services, and then and, and they're raising capital. And so as they are funded, they will either likely 
be acquired or license their technology or move to a traditional manufacturing space. So we we can we, we can meet there's those plenty types to of do needs. before you start building widgets. Yes. And honestly, there's plenty to do with your business before sometimes you're ready for a facility. Yeah. We're so blessed that we have now the variety of accelerators, pre-accelerators, mm -hmm. traditional services like Career Tech has always offered. I mean, it if you have an idea, there is a resource for you. Right. And and likely an incentive for you. And partners and yes. collaborators. Yes. Yes. It's a very deep bench. Right. And that is what I like to preach the most. <laughs> because your location also has uh, the the entrepreneurism program for high school. It does. High schoolers and the, the DECA connection that yes. they have. And now even a podcast studio and all kinds yeah. of other things for for those young people. Right. To, to be entrepreneurial before they probably even know what yes, that word means. It's, it's really interesting. That entire campus from like a... Uh, I don't know, call it like learning environment, it is, is innovation focused. And so there are the STEM academies there, pre-engineering, um, uh, biomedical sciences, entrepreneurship program, interactive media. And, um, and we do have some traditional career training programs at that campus as well. Like um, we have cosmetology, we will have aesthetics, there's automotive training. So it, it does follow like the programming of a uh, traditional tech center what you think of with the full-time programs. Right. But we, the thing that I think like to educate people on career tech as well is that everybody thinks of our two-year programs, which are awesome. And, but we also have business and industry services. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you'll hear people say, wed this, wed that, but it's workforce and economic development. And that's for existing and incumbent workers and companies. Right. And so it's amazing to be able to have industry leading the classroom and for those students to have that exposure to those companies. So many of them will come and do internships with um, our incubator clients. They, uh, when they're working on their capstone projects, they'll come down and talk to the founders that are engineers. And so it, it's, it's a very cool microcosm. And you've also now you have some people in the incubation system and they're graduating, they're yes. moving on to, to, real or the air quotes are like real spaces, like their own spaces, whether it's larger or they just need different things mm -hmm. or they, or they've just gone through the program and they're ready to be off in the real yeah. world alumni that are graduating into the real world. Yes. You also are heavily participating in OVF. Mm -hmm. like you are the, the immediate past chair. I am. One, one more week of, of leading things. We have one more meeting and you'll be complete with that. How long have you been involved with OVF and what originally drew you to that. And then we could talk about what OVF is. doing. Yeah. So I think my first exposure to OVF was probably in like 2008 or nine. And um, that was whenever I was a, a, a founder in the incubator and I uh, was trying to network and mm -hmm. it is really the preeminent relationship building thing. And back then, like we have always had incredible resources in Oklahoma, but we have not had incredible awareness or, um, delivery of said systems and that's because it was in the big like in the beginning which ovf has been around since 87 but a lot of times it was you had to know somebody right. you had to know somebody and you had to get through those gatekeepers and what i love about where it is now and with the ecosystem now is that we get to all be gate openers yes and so it's i keep saying deep bench but it really is so that's how i got involved with ovf first was as a uh person just trying to learn the lay of the land. And then I got to come in as an actual program manager mm. and um, participate that way. And then I, I don't know, I got to do a fellowship with I2E. And at the time they were kind of, cause they've been around, I mean, they just had their 25th, 25th anniversary, right. and, but, but they're really, it was, it was kind of that. And they're, you know, it was a much smaller group of people that were trying to do everything and be all things to everyone. And now we all get to kind of get rich in our niche and help people with the part that we're subject matter experts and then connect them to someone else that's going to do incredible things for them. So how long have you been a board member? of? I think that I'm going to say since this is kind of fuzzy. I think that it was when I came back from Colorado. So that was in 2018. Okay. And I. I was doing some things for Saxum at that time, and Daniel Will reached out because OVF is a statewide organization, and sometimes it does become Oklahoma City-centric mm -hmm. just because of convenience, but 
there was an intentional purpose to try to have um, rural board members. And so they had reached out and said, hey, you're rural. You, you've been around. Right. We can slot you in. You will show up. Right. And, and so that is how And I, you'll bring value. Yes. 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 That too. You've, it's not just having people in the room. It's people that are bringing value to the room. Yes. Yes. And so, and that was around the same time too that the um, Oklahoma Venture OVRC. I can't remember. It, but it had iterations. But that was also like trying to tell Oklahoma's story outside. So there was like right. the tours around to like we'd go to Ardmore, to Enid, to whatever. And so it lined up really perfectly with OVF's intention of getting back out into those, which goes back to community partners. And so we were able to like because I was out in those part corners of the state to go represent and to talk about OVF and try to, you know, encourage, uh, you know, the value of membership. Then eventually you're asked to be the chair. Yeah. You would be the, right. So you're the vice chair and then the chair, you yes. know how the uh, progresses. Well, I actually didn't have to go through that process. Did you, oh, did you get swapped around? Cause you know, I got swapped around. Yeah. I got swapped around. I got swapped around with Danny because Danny had active duty. He had to go, yeah. had to go uh, somewhere in the world. He couldn't tell us where he was or what he was doing. Right. So I got swapped. So you were, you were swapped yeah, around. So around. Henry retired. And so Jennifer got to do basically one and a half terms. Right. And then when Jennifer termed out and went, was at OCAST, um, Jenny Edwards was actually going to be the incoming chair. And then, you know. People have families and people have uh, priorities and life exists beyond our service. And so she was like, hey, you know, do you want to trade? And uh, so I, Shay called me and she was like, hey, will you do this? But I was, it was like literally right when I was starting at Francis Tuttle as well, when I first got pulsed. And so I had so much change and I'm, I'm also working on my doctorate right now. Oh, and so, on top of all of that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, why not? Um, and so I was like, oh my gosh, I'm in like the throes of grad school. I'm learning a uh, new, even though I'd been in career tech <laughs> and I'd done the job, it's it's a new culture. It's a new building, a new team. Um, and so. My new building, literally like there was. Yes, like, this is the third were, academic year there, of There, there the were rooms not that w had never been used before. Correct. Either, like furniture and shrink wrap and all kinds of yeah. things like that. So it was, it was kind of wild. I'm like, okay, well, I'm making up my role here and I guess I'm going to just, and, and I had called a few of the OVF people that I had been, I'm going to say mentors to me. And literally every single one of them said, because I was going to say no, because I was like, I have too much on my plate. Every single person that I reached out to said, uh, before you say no, think back about what has OVF given you. And wow. I was like, well, anytime I had a career transition, I needed a recommendation there was an appointment, something spurred out of those OVF relationships. And so then I was, you know, kind of sat and reflected for a minute. I was like, you know what? OVF has given me so much. So it dovetails with what I'm doing anyways. Uh, sure. You know, give me the gavel. And as you took that appointment and yes. said, yes, I will do it, even though I have all of these things on my plate, you also kind of made it a little bit harder on yourself. Why? You oh, could oh. You could have come in and said status quo is fine and I'm just going to fly under the radar and get this done because I have many Stagnancy other things on my plate. Friend. But no, <laughs> no, no. Kara says we need to recommit yes. to our statewide presence. Which is my rural bias showing. Yes. <laughs> and, but fair enough and, and accurate. And a, a majority of the board members agreed with that. And so we made the commitment to having three, yes. which I thought we would get lucky to get one. Amazing if we got two. The fact that we had three, I yes. was blown away by three OVF regular meetings in Tulsa. Yes. So Oklahoma City and Tulsa, we are statewide. We are service mm -hmm. in the area. We had presentations and pitch days yes. in both Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Yeah. You put a lot on your plate for your year as the, as the chair. You know what? But it's a great team. I didn't do it all. You carried a lot of the burden. Jennifer came back, even though she's also in the new role. And there was all this, you know, like the SSBCI money and right. all these things and the new accelerators. DBB money. Like, and, yes. And, right. There was so much happening in her role that was new, too. Like we were all managing a bunch of change for the positive. Yes. But I think that everybody believes in it. And we all have clients and service areas that overlap. Oklahoma is a very small state. Mm. And when you think of like, I mean, yes. so. Yes, I, I, I was small, but spread out, spread out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So catalyst. Yes. But I did not do it alone. Mm. I mean, Shay and Jenny are there. You helped. Jennifer helped. Um, uh, Alex, uh, Lebodiak, Lebodiak I mean, partners like 36 degrees north helping Amazing. us with the venue, 
recommending caterers, um, having the AV, you know, helping us transition from going to Zoom to YouTube Live. We had a new lo- new home in Oklahoma City as yes. well, same time. Yeah, which go Career Tech. So <laughs> right, they, Metro yeah, Tech. Yeah, so up. Metro Tech's wonderful. You know, Aaron Collins is great, and Vincent is our coordinator. Uh, they're at the Spring Lake campus. I know that made it a little bit um, inconvenient for those that work downtown and were used to, you know, just, but space is kind of at a premium and there's so much going on. It's hard to find somewhere no. where you could have a consistent right. meeting spot and had AV and acoustics, but the customer service is just incredible. Right. And I mean, they're in our ecosystem too. Or even just parking. Yes. Yes. Parking, <laughs> parking and access to a highway. Yeah. Simple things like that. But yeah, it's been an amazing move to our new home at the, at the Spring Lake campus mm-hmm. for Metro Tech and the involvement with 36 degrees. Yes. Yeah. We couldn't so do it without our it partners next year. So you can say I did a lot, but really, I just connect dots you still, and smile. You still could have let some things slide and you refuse to do it, which I, I appreciate. I love your gumption for that. <laughs> so as someone who has the mindset and represents rural Oklahoma versus urban, what are one of your or two of your top frustrations that you think folks in the rural areas feel when it comes to things like career tech and, and to access to capital and and the things that are necessary for someone to start a business? Well, I would argue that it's actually very rich because um, Oklahoma is blessed to still have so many um, locally owned chartered small banks. Yes, that's true. And so a lot of the businesses that you see there are, I mean, however, the broadband stuff and the amount of remote workers Mm -hmm. that have moved to Oklahoma could change this. But a lot of times, I would say 80, 85% are not going to be venture backable. And so they're going to have a traditional lending right. path. Um, and there are facilities where maybe someone um, had that rural to urban migration because they needed additional workforce or amenities or whatever. So space does open up. Um, but but Career Tech's footprint is massive. Mm. I mean, of the 77 counties, I think, let's see, Brent Haken will be like, oh, she messes <laughs> up. But like, I want to say that there's only like now, like two maybe that we're not, I think it's like, because Panhandle wow. was a white space, Grant yeah. County is a white space, but they pay to send their kids to Pioneer Tech and to Autry, and and so, um, and then Beaver County was, but they, you know, there's a bus driver shortage and and um, CDL drivers in general. Mm. Northwest Tech and High Plains Tech uh, recognize this for those public school systems because you have consolidated districts or there's so much distance between. Right. So a frustration might be geographic isolation. Because that just increases your embodied energy cost and makes everything a little bit take longer and a little bit more expensive. And but people, I think, are are used to it out there. But anyways, they worked and they uh, um, it was Adam Honeyman was kind of the lead on it. But he they put together a bus driver program and arranged with um, uh, to have the testing and everything out there. And they ended up, I think, with like almost thirty new drivers to the area. And so Beaver County, like, is. Property taxes are what fund a tech center. And so they were like, oh, my gosh, we didn't know the value of this before. I mean, we know that, you know, it's uh, enriching for kids to go and like to learn a trade or to do their like maybe AP classes or, you know, tech centers are often a, a school of choice and a consolidated school for a lot of those rural areas um, because they just don't have those labs and those. I mean, it's expensive to have that kind of stuff and then to have an instructor. But anyways, they saw the value. They decided to vote and annex themselves. And so. We got one more uh, county out of the white. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it's it's great. So, but resources for people starting a business in rural, I think it's literally just sometimes the people that you go to for access to programming, just like anything, they have probably been there doing it for a long time by themselves, and so sometimes someone is going to retire or you might face burnout, and then there's that learning curve. For someone to come in. That loss of institutional knowledge. And right. and then you have to make all of those relationships again. But there's incredible programs like Main Street, like, um, you know, uh, the Business Roundtable, um, Select Oklahoma, the Oklahoma Municipal League. I mean, there are literally so Farm many. Bureau. Farm Bureau. Yeah. Their accelerator program yeah. is incredible. And the work that Amory is doing and the way that she is getting out across the entire state and adjusted it. Because a lot of times we think of an accelerator as being something, you know, well, one, because you have proximity, and so things might go off in, you know, like a 12-week program. Well, the rural one is stretched out over six months because you have people that have 
their full-time jobs or they're also managing a farm or they have to drive. And so you lose, you know, a whole day or you tack on days because if you have to travel and you have to have a hotel and you have to have these. So it's the um, flexibility and um, accommodations being made to serve rural, I'm very proud of. I want to get your take on this because I think one of the amazing opportunities that has presented itself in Oklahoma entrepreneurially is the the leaning into our strengths. So yes. the adaptation of things that we've learned in agriculture, the things mm-hmm. that we've learned in, in oil and gas, yeah. uh, whether it's development of technology, remote mm-hmm. monitoring, aerial uh, equipment, yeah. uh, farm equipment, manufacturing, all those things now we're adapting to other industries yes. and, and utilizing it in other ways. Yeah, transferable that, that, technology, that, transferable skills. Right. It, it's what I love about it is that Oklahoma – I feel like is entrepreneurial from the get go. I too. I agree too. I I I I wholeheartedly believe that. I believe and agricultural states. Yes. Are, are the, yes, yes because you have to create your own yes. and they're younger states so they didn't have the infrastructure. And so like they literally made it up as they went. And so many invention and innovation not be cliché but it does come from necessity. Mm. And so you have people that are out there figuring out so they not only have to figure out like maybe the mechanics of it or the development of it they also have to know how to maintain it and to be basically their own remote field. Like, I mean, it's, it's, you have to wear all hats. And so you've end up with very comprehensive knowledge and um, you're solving problems that then, like you said, can translate to other sectors and um, also just growing our own. Flyover states get a bad rap. I love what the Midcontinent VC summit is doing. I love that, you know, like the, uh, just the quality of life and things that we provide and that people are now seeing like, Oh no, there there's, there's stuff happening there. Right, right. And so, um, but it, but it is still hard to import talent because if someone comes and say they have a family or say they have, you know, like if they don't have their support system, mm-hmm. it makes it hard for them to really put down roots and stay. Um, but we've done a great job of when people serve in military, whether it's like Tinker or Fort Sill mm-hmm. or Vance, they love Oklahoma and we get a lot of really cool talent and knowledge um, from retired uh, veterans right. and growing our own wise, you know, having these resources in place and exposing students to entrepreneurship as young as like third and fifth grade. I think that they it's almost just embedded. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that we're I mean, we're kind of doing that even with like the startup scene. We are literally growing our own talent and growing our own employers and reasons to import wealth to the state. Because we are exporting our um, products our and services yeah, <laughs> without having the brain drain. Right. Yes. And I think it's also a continuation of what started, what brought you back to the state with the Boomerang Project. That yeah. now is, is Tulsa Remote right. is, 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 is an adaptation of that idea yes. and all those things that go into I would argue they took it so far above and beyond and the things that they've done, like, was unreal. With, because of a, a couple of amazing partners. That, yes. that made it work. I'm sure a lot of people around the country be like, "Yeah, let's do that," and they just don't have the people right uh, at the top who could who could invest who could do that. But that goes the to yeah. people that love Oklahoma right. and stayed here and continue to reinvest in it. And I think that you might not have that scale of a uh, partner in every community, but there is someone behind the scenes. If they aren't making it happening, they are enabling the opportunity to exist for sure. I'm going to end this podcast episode by asking you the question I ask everyone on the OVF podcast. Okay. And that question is, what is your favorite piece of advice for a Oklahoma entrepreneur? Uh, go to your tech center. It's, it's a one-stop shop. You go in, we're all connected. It doesn't matter if I'm the one that is going to serve you. I can connect you to the other state agencies, to relationships within o- like my network through OVF to the other tech centers, to our other departments, campuses. Your first stop, no matter where you are in the state, if you want to start something, do something, go to your tech center. There you go. That is perfect advice and a perfect summation of our conversation today. Yeah. We Full circle, much like your career has come full circle. We Where we started is where we yes. ended. So we came full circle again. Thank you, Kara, for being on the yeah. podcast today. And thank you guys for listening to this great episode. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. We still have... More episodes coming up. Things are changing at the Golden Group, but we are continuing on this podcast for a little while longer with great guests like Kara 
and some others that we have lined up. So make sure you hit that subscribe button, share on social media, find Kara on social media, yeah. find the access program, find Francis Tuttle also on social media, find OVF on social yes. media as well. Do all those things. And we will see you again in a couple of weeks with a new episode of the Strategic Growth Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Golden Group Strategic Growth Podcast. Please subscribe so you never miss an episode. Follow the Golden Group on social media. For more information, past episodes, or to contact us, please visit thegoldengroup.com.